you know, as you worship, just so many things come through your minds. And that one of those earlier hymns, it talked about in the, it was that, the one about the cross, it talked about saints being raised. And, you know, I think uh, the, the writer of the hymn was referring to that passage in the Gospels where it said, when it talked about the crucifixion of Jesus, that many saints were raised and appeared to many after Jesus' resurrection from the tomb. Now, Bill's going to explain all that to you later on at lunch. Uh, but puzzling, mysterious things happen, you know. Were those people people that they recognized? Were they recently dead? Had they been dead for hundreds of years? You know, uh, some things God doesn't give us all the information on, but it was just affirming the power of the cross and the resurrection because, because it just, things were breaking open. Well, we, are, we aren't going to have a text from that today, but we are going to look at Isaiah chapter 35, which uh, is a, a very encouraging, uh, uh, I mean, there's a lot. I love Isaiah 12, Isaiah 53. There's, there's so many texts, Isaiah 40. But 35 is also one of my favorites in the entire book of Isaiah. So let's read that together. Follow along if you can. And listen to the word of God there. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees say to those who have an anxious heart be strong fear not behold your God will come with vengeance with the recompense of God he will come and save you then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy for waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become like reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there and it shall be called the way of holiness. And the unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. And they shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads, and they shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Let's pray. Lord, open your word to us. What a glorious word it is to us today. For when we see the implications of this, how they come down to us even today, we bless your name and we love to sit at table with you here in, in, in the presence of the Holy Spirit through your word. Amen. Well, uh, there's a lot of contrast here. If you noticed what was going on in the previous chapters, I hope you keep up on your reading if we even skip a section or two in Isaiah. But there, uh, it sort of it ended on a, a real dour note, like sulfur and burning and, and wasteland was, was the last chapter there where he was talking about Edom, one of the enemies of God. And then he turns the page... <laughs> Certainly, literally, figuratively, I don't know how to say it, but it, it's a whole different climate when we come to chapter 35. And he, he pictures, instead of sulfur and burning and wasteland, he pr pictures the, the, the wilderness beginning to bloom. 
Now, let me just give you one little technical thing from this chapter for your thinking later on. This is what's called a chiasm in uh, uh, Hebrew. And if you were at our Sunday night uh, prayer times, we talked about this a little bit the other night. And it's a special way of building poetry, not with rhymes like we do in English, but with thought units beginning with the, the, the world, the wilderness, nature, then going to man, and then in the middle is a special statement, then it goes back to man, and then it goes back to nature again. So it's A, A down here, B, B, and C right in the middle. Now maybe that doesn't mean anything to you. It does especially have to, but it helps you see what thought is being brought out here because in a chiasm, it's the middle which is determinative for all the rest of what's going on around it. And if you look at your text here and if, if you read that, you'll see that the middle of the text is God appearing. Look at verse 4. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God, and he will come and save you. So right in the middle of this discussion of nature, man, and nature, man and nature again, is this important thought. It is God who is coming to save. So everything that's spoken about in those other realms is dependent poetically, and we would say spiritually too, and ultimately upon God appearing to save. So that, with that center thought, he says, well, how is God going to save us? Well, first of all, he's going to even work in the realm of nature. And so he picks it up at the beginning there. The wilderness shall be, the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. Now, we've got a little taste of that recently here in Michigan, didn't we? We've had a long, dry spell. Some of you native Michiganders probably thought Michigan was turning into the desert there because it was so dry here. But that's not, we're not, be, we haven't begun to look wildernessly in Michigan. I mean, the wilderness is a re what we would commonly think of as a desert. Very little growth, no rain, dangerous place to be. And I think one of the reasons Isaiah uses this is because it also connects very prominently with the life of Israel, God's people. Where did they go when they came out of Egypt? The wilderness. Forty years, God had to, he says, I, I carried you in the wilderness. I humbled you in the wilderness. I took care of you and fed you with bread from heaven in the wilderness. And so that is, if you think of the average reader of Isaiah, that would have been something, a connection right there. But only this is different now, isn't it? The wilderness is going to be glad. The wilderness is going to rejoice. The wilderness is going to blossom abundantly. And in fact, he gives three separate little word pictures to describe the beauty of what God was going to do. He says, he says, Lebanon and Mount Carmel and Sharon. And those were in the ancient world, always places of prominent beauty. Lebanon was covered with forests and had the seacoast. It was a rich, you remember Solomon, uh, uh, Solomon has to send away, or well, it's actually his father David, sends away from timbers in Lebanon because they were the finest in the world. And Mount Carmel was this, this uh, uh, beautiful higher mountain there uh, and which was co often covered with snow and had streams and vegetation uh, on it. And then Sharon was a plain uh, on the eastern, western part of the land of Palestine, which was also noted for its fertility. And God says, look, when I work, when I work, it's like deserts turning into those kinds of places. 
Now, we don't have to necessarily think that he's literally going to do that. Uh, God could, of course, but he's speaking about God's coming to save. So it's probably just a metaphorical idea. What God can come into the wilderness of your life as well. And, or, or we should even go broader. He, he can come into the wilderness of this sinful created world. And he has done that and he continues to do that. I mean, if you think of, of the world, and we are discouraged with many of the things we see in the world, but if you think of the world in terms of where it was 2,000 years ago and where the gospel has penetrated and changed people and societies and, and uh, whole nations, it's like the desert blooming. It was darkness. It was dry. And now the gospel continues to go out. Well, the second then, uh, theme here in this chiastic po parable here is that there's not only going to be this sort of creational revival, that's a picture of salvation, but there's messianic hope. Messianic hope tied to the human beings of this world. And, and we read it in, in two different sections of that. If we, we see it at verse 3 where he says, Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to the anxious who have, say to those who have an anxious or a hasty heart in the Hebrew there, be strong and fear not. And then you drop down past the chiastic middle and it says, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. And then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy for waters shall break forth in the wilderness. So you have now the human element that Isaiah the prophet picks up. He says, this salvation of God is not just a material thing for the betterment of creation, though that is a necessary thing and a good thing as well. This is for people. This is pe for people who are at their end. I mean, uh, verse 3 says, strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. That's... That's a description of people who are afraid, people who are weak, people who don't know where to, to turn. If you've ever been, uh, people react differently to emergency situations, but a very common reaction to emergency situations is just to go flat, <laughs> you know, to not, your hands shake, they lose all their strength. You feel like your knees are buckling. That's the picture of Isaiah. That's the picture Isaiah gives of people without God, people without hope. And he says it doesn't have to be that way. God is coming to save. Strengthen those hands. Have hope again. And the signs that he gives that of this coming salvation to man are these beautiful ones here. The eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, and the lame man shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Where did we see those things happening, children? Hmm? Where do you see those happening? All over in the Gospels, in, in the work of Jesus. The, the blind guy at the pool of Siloam comes back seeing. The deaf guy hears and talks again. Uh, the lame leap. And, and, and in fact, John says, this happened so much that I wouldn't have enough room in the world to write all the books about the things that Jesus did. I mean, we have really in the Gospels, there's a lot of those things but we're just getting a smattering. You know, they, they came by the hundreds and were healed by Jesus. They thronged him so heavily that he couldn't even eat. 
He was healing so many and helping so many. And there are just some incidences of that. And John the Baptist, you know, when he was in prison, uh, he, he was doubts in his heart because he was suffering and he was in prison. And, and uh, he thought the Messiah was maybe going to be different than what he thought. And so he sent the question to Jesus. He said, are you the one or should we look for somebody else? And what did Jesus, what was the answer he sent back to him? He sent him to Isaiah. He says, hey, John, look, the blind have their eyes open. The ears of the deaf are unstopped. The lame are leaping like a deer. The gospel is being preached to the poor. Blessed is that man who does not doubt me. That's John's uh, that was the, the commentary uh, there concerning John. And so God is preparing a great salvation and he's making it known too. You know, it's just like, is he the Messiah? Is he the, really the one? Look. Look what he has done. You couldn't walk yesterday for 38 years you laid by the pool Today, you're leaping. You couldn't see. Today, you're seeing. And on and on the story goes. God's salvation is coming for man. So you have in the first part of the chapter, creation being affected. Now, humanity in general and all this healing be infected, but then the third part, and, and that's why, I mean, you could break this chapter up and, and do another sermon uh, on the third part, but it is tied very closely, I think, the highway of holiness, the, the road to redemption is the third part. Why does uh, Isaiah kind of separate it out like that? Well, my idea is this, it's not enough to have a great savior, and a great salvation, it needs to be personal for people. It needs to be their Savior. Jesus needs to be their Master and Lord and King and the one who is healing them and strengthening them in this life. And that's what we get in the last part of the chapter then, this idea of a highway of, whole, uh, of salvation. And let me read those verses again. And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. This is a specific road. Now, in the context of wildernesses, they were dangerous places to travel through, not only because of the climate and stuff, but, I mean, after all, who makes a road in the wilderness? There's no sense, no reason to, just stay out of places like that. But God does. He says, I'm making a highway of salvation. Uh, and, and he calls it, and I call it, the redemption road, because down in verses 9, uh, it says there, the redeemed shall walk on it. Verse 10, the ransom of the Lord will return. And those terms are, 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 are taken from the ancient world where, where you had to pay a price to set people free. This was, had a long history in Israel. Uh, they... They were to rescue their relatives if they fell into poverty and debt, and they were to buy them free. They were to take their land over if they couldn't uh, afford to, to manage their land. This idea of redemption ha has, has a wide berth there. And, of course, in the New Testament, it becomes even more specific, doesn't it? Because we realize in the New Testament that that ransom is going to be paid by God himself. That this same Messiah 
who's coming, who can open the eyes of the blind, who can cause the deaf to hear again, who can cause the lame to leap like a deer, is the one who is also going to buy them back from their sins. And that's why it says there, the unclean shall not pass over it. Well, how, how can that be a reference to us? I mean, we're all unclean as human beings because Jesus pays for that uncleanness. Jesus takes it, takes it, takes us, takes it away from us and he puts our feet on this solid road of salvation which is going to walk us up all the way to heaven. Uh, there's, there's some other things in here that are, are so beautiful as well. Uh, <laughs> this particular phrase always speaks to my heart. It says, It shall belong to those who walk on the way, and even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. You know, how do we know we're going to keep walking on that road? I mean, we look at our own lives and we say we're unworthy, we're stupid, we're foolish at times. But God's power is greater than that. God's work of Jesus in us enables us, even if we're foolish, silly people, to keep our feet on the pathway. Our salvation is secure in him there. And then there's protection. No lion shall be there. As, as you walk through this life, you need to realize that, that, that God is hedging you in. He's protecting you. He's caring for you all of the time. Your whole journey of salvation, your whole journey through life here, God is is protecting you and it's going to get better even because he ends then on this note here, this note in, in this section about personal salvation. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. And they shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The road to heaven is straight and narrow, but it's a good road. And it's a road of increasing joy. Now, this was probably written, of course, in the context to the people of, of the Jewish nation coming back from their captivity in Babylon. There, That would have been the historical context, but the, the spiritual context in, in, this, in this messianic chapter is that that salvation is a place of joy and in fact it's everlasting joy not some temporary fix for your life not something that's going to come and go but something that is forever and ever and it will increase as you go along uh, because it says everlasting joy shall be on their head and, yet, and they shall obtain gladness and joy. As you walk with Jesus, that is an increasing thing in your life until the day when all sorrow and sighing shall flee away. That's probably a reference, beloved, to heaven because we'll still have some sorrows and sighing in this life but in the life to come, only joy, only perfection, only gladness in our God forever and forever. Amen. Shall we pray? Lord, you promised such a great salvation. You have done a great salvation. In Isaiah's day, he could only see it in the pictures, but we see it in its reality and its fullness in our Lord Jesus. And we are walking on the road of holiness to heaven itself. Call many more. If there's someone here today whose heart is, is yet 
feeble and fearful and afraid, may their eyes be open to Jesus today. We pray it in his name. Amen.